Aloha, happy Friday. I'm Kawi Lucas with Hawaii is my mainland. And um, it's kind of unusual for me to have the United States um, uh, writ large um, on the show, but um, Honolulu has just been honored really um, with a, we have a huge opportunity. And this week, um, the Rockefeller Foundation sent a Katya, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce her last name, um, to Honolulu to, to begin discussions on what it means for Honolulu to participate in the 100 Resilient Cities Challenge. So with me to discuss this is Rob Kinslow, who is a sustainability coach. And um, Rob has been following this story, and he was at two meetings this week with Katya, and maybe no. you know how to pronounce her name. Sien Kowitz. Whoa, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, Rob, the, um, you are a sustainability coach, yeah. and you, you, you haven't switched over to a resiliency coach yet. Well, <laughs> uh, sustainability is just one step away from resilience. Um, if you think of survivability, sustainability, resilience, and then restor restoration, that's kind of the pathway that we're on. And sustainability has been coming into uh, prominence m much more recently. And now resilience has come in because resilience means the ability to uh, adapt and respond to shocks to the system, either acute or chronic, and to return to some sense of normalcy, whatever normalcy is for that area. And sustainability really means to, to sustain, sustain and to have the next generation have the same resources and, and opportunities that we have. So you've been kicking around in this uh, regenerative world yeah. um, for, for quite a while. Yeah. Um, and you got sort of a, a very honored early start being part of the um, nine, the cohort of oh, nine. Yeah. Yep. Would you want to talk about that with um, Al Gore's uh, program? Well, I guess in... 2000, late 2006, maybe this time, 2006, I was watching Oprah, and she had Al Gore on, and Al Gore said, hey, I'm running this training in 2007. So I went online right away and applied, and uh, I got selected out of 16,000 applicants, along with uh, nine other people, or eight other people here in Honolulu, and we went to Nashville and were trained to talk about the science of climate change and the solutions to uh, our shared collective challenges, uh, in that case it was climate change, and this was long before the consensus belief in climate change had even developed, and of course we have some problems still with that today, but uh, since then I've been able to talk to many diverse groups and learn how to language the science and be a climate change communicator. So um, this new opportunity with the Rockefeller Foundation, mm -hmm. so what, is, what does it mean to be to be selected as one of the hundred cities, and I think we have a we have a graphic here that shows how um, they're they're really incredibly global. If you go to the website, mm -hmm. which is 100rc.org, yep. um, you can see. Um, oh, here we have one about this is uh, this is the specific about uh, the challenges. So these are the ones that were selected for Honolulu. Okay. The Aging infrastructure, these are the specific... Well, let me talk over this a little bit, if okay. you don't mind. Um, yeah. So I'll give you a little background um, uh, while um, the readers are looking at that slide. Um, the uh, background is, is that in 2013, the Rockefeller Foundation saw the need and actually allocated $170 million to go out and kind of catalyze and encourage cities around the world. And they started in Asia. Uh, Singapore, Malaysia, to encourage cities to uh, hire and develop a so-called chief resilience officer or someone who can catalyze, um, facilitate, and coordinate uh, the activities of evaluating, developing a, a strategy from that a plan and and implementing that plan in every city according to the place-based needs of each city. It's really interesting that they've chosen cities as the organizational level to focus on. Um, yeah, I can talk about that because, see, what has happened is that with the difficulty we had with the United Nations and the COP process 
Uh, that would be the Council of Parties. Yes. Um, you know, getting a climate change agreement, it took us 20 years or more. Um, uh, funders and people who were in, you know, smart and wanted to really move a lot faster decided that they could go to municipalities and states, smaller organizations within those nations. Didn't need the permission of the politicians at the national level. So kind of a grassroot, a group grassroots. Yeah, a group grassroots. Yeah, <laughs> GGR. I like it. <laughs> yeah, and, and they've been wildly successful. Uh, there's been three cohorts. Uh, first group of 33, second group of 35, I think, and then Honolulu was selected as the third cohort, which actually puts us in a good position because we can now look back at all the lessons learned and all the plans that other cities have already developed and are developing and merge them into our planning. So the, um, the when I, I was at the um, Expo, the World Expo last year in Milan, and when mm. they were looking at the <coughs> futures, that was the, compl that was the focus that, uh, that the cities of the futures, mm. municipalities would be rising in power and in mm -hmm. importance. It was very interesting to have then this, this come to home. <laughs> well, and, and this is a central uh, concept in sustainable development is actually decentralization of power, decentralization of energy mm. production, decentralization of food production. And to do that uh, means that national entities will probably either follow or uh, not follow these smaller municipalities and smaller, you know, uh, uh, regions. So maybe I should rethink Hawaii as my mainland to uh, Oahu as my mainland? I don't know. <laughs> we'll think about it. But anyway, so tell us about the, the Rockefeller Foundation, mm. $170 million. That's significant infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, Katja came here. There was a meeting at the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well. Uh, the mayor wasn't there, but the mayor was traveling. And I have to say that I was astonished by the amount of support and um, attention. There was every city department. There was people from the community, from UH, from uh, the government, and from business there. And, um, you know, um, hazards management, National Disaster Preparedness Center, uh, you know, representatives from other islands and other wow. uh, uh, were there. There was at least 38 people there and the room was filled and uh, they all got briefed. Everybody's interested in this. It's, it's a, a, a huge shift from 2007 when I first started talking about climate change and other people. This is, this is some critically needed good news. Yes, it is. Rob. <laughs> on this front no matter what's happening in other places right we've got our head screwed on right right okay. we have a lot ahead of us though okay so tell us what what this could mean or tell us what 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 sort of what the process is overall mm. and then um and then what's next okay so uh the, the process is really um uh, basically a funnel and so we start out big and we go, we narrow our priorities to a plan and a strategy, and then we go big again in terms of implementation. So that's the basic structure of the plan. It goes from here to here and it discovery into prioritization and then into development. And so wh what that means uh, in more detail is that during the discovery process, the CRO who will get hired next year uh, we'll will, get, uh, will be selected next year. Will be selected next year. Um, and he'll report to the managing director of the city. Okay. And he will, go ahead. Go ahead. He, he will then um, go out and start surveying and bring it, doing cross silo work, trying to break down, s assembling all the plans. And this will then lead to uh, a, a strategy of priorities. Okay. Or a list of priorities. All right, Rob. Well, we'll come back after a short break and talk about more about whether he or she. Yep. Uh, exactly. Uh, what she'll do here. There's a lot of women in sustainability, so I suspect that it will be a woman. Wow. Okay.
Aloha, welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kaui Lucas, and with me here on uh, this gorgeous winter Friday yeah. in Honolulu is Rob Kinslow, and we are talking about a really amazing opportunity here that Honolulu has been selected as one of the 100 resilient cities by the Rockefeller Foundation. Yeah. Okay, so what what are we what are we going to get out of this? We we just meant we j we're just talking about the chief resilience officer. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes, okay. uh, we're going to have a chief resilience officer who will evaluate, plan, and coordinate across all departments and across the city and county of Honolulu. Funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. For two years. For two years, yes. For two years. And with that, of course, we'll need to be some staff. So the city will have to come up with its own funding for the staff. But in any case, he will use the basic framework that we were talking about before the break to develop a re resilient strategy, hopefully within the first six months to a year. By the end of year one, we should have a resilient strategy for the city and county of Honolulu. Okay. And that includes physical structure, social structure, and physical structure, social structure, and some of the challenges that we have to meet. So this was our, um, this is how they, they build Honolulu. The culturally diverse Hawaiian capital faces numerous climate and weather related challenges that could impair the tourism focused local economy, which could further increase homelessness. So this is how they put it together, but it was a team from Hawaii that um, had to apply from the mayor's office yeah. or... I, I don't know that, I wasn't involved in the application okay. process. Right. I only have been involved in the, uh, because I became the, I was asked to be the point person for the Sierra Club on uh, this project. I have only become uh, part of it as the announcement came out. So I attended both meetings, I've done my own research, and so far I'm hoping to be involved uh, going down the road. Okay, and they've, I did the specific challenges um, let, uh, we had up before, and this is um, how the um, city of New Orleans, or specifically the I'm, I'm maybe pronouncing this wrong, Chantilly, a resilience district is, this is what they came up with at the end. So these are the kind of things, I guess, right? Yeah, so for example, uh, you see community adaptation there. Now, adaptation is a word that means that you're able to uh, respond to uh, a forcing function or a, a act of God or a hurricane in the case of New Orleans. and. Uh, have a plan in place to deal with these responses. You go out and you survey all the possible things that could happen to you, and then you develop a plan for each one. And, and adaptation is different from mitigation. Mitigation is before the fact. Adaptation is after the fact. But you, if you do an adaptation plan, then you can respond better after the fact. So uh, there were uh, quite a few sort of disaster-related uh, folks at the meeting at East-West Center, yeah. um, the subsequent one. Yeah. Um, so that that has a role in this. Yeah. And um, what are the other? What else will we be getting as part of this process? Well, we have a robust disaster preparedness uh, uh, infrastructure in terms of people and all here in Honolulu at UH and in the city. In the city, it's it's hazard mitigation, uh, which covers uh, some of these things. Um, the challenge, I think, with Honolulu is we have multiple stakeholders. We have the military, we have the tourist industry, we have the communities, we have government, you know, we have uh, conservation people, we have uh, terrain that rises and falls, we have cultural considerations uh, to speak of. So we have a multitude of stakeholders that have to be brought into the process. And inclusiveness is one of the chief values of, of this uh, effort. And so I, I would say that uh, the, uh, when it comes to you know, questions like, are we going to let people in Kahala harden the coastline, you know, have uh, seawalls when, uh, when their beaches and their yards start being eroded away? Are we, who's going to, are we going to harden the beaches in Waikiki? And what will that do with the sand? Uh, what about harbors and uh, airports? And, you know, are we just going to put a big wall around the island like the Maldives have done? You know, how are we going to respond to these? Uh, yeah, so she, um, Katya spoke about Rotterdam. And yeah, that, Rotterdam. Uh, I took a look at their website. Uh, again, this was oh, yeah. the 100RC. They've just posted the, um, 
strategies the uh, uh. for Rotterdam. So uh -huh. um, she said that it's they're living eight feet under <laughs> sea level. <laughs> sea level. Yeah. And that they're doing it really well. So this is a really exciting thing to have uh, the exchange. I think. Yeah, because that would be a nice lesson learned for New Orleans, for example, who is also below sea level most of it. Uh, using levees and all. Of course, Rotterdam has a much more sophisticated because they've been doing it for much longer. Um, so besides the, the resilience of, uh, officer, we are also going to get some kinds of um, uh, consulting it, uh, she was talking about too. Right, so the, the, the flow goes two ways. Not only is the flow coming, gonna, isn't, is the CRO going to have to bring in information from various cross-sectoral uh, sources um, in government and academics and in community, but he's also going to be consulting with the Rockefeller Foundation and with the other cities. And for example, there's a summit that the CROs go to every year to exchange ideas and best practices so that they can cross pollinate um, the, each other. And as far as um, the sort of the takeaway on this, I mean, are, are we are we then going to have this um, CRO ongoing? Or? Well, that's a question that is a political question. Um, you know, you know, who is going to be the CRO? I think that's going to be uh, a political question. Uh, and I also think that if the forces of climate change, sea level rise, uh, that we are anticipating arrive in Honolulu in the islands, you know, in the next 10 years, as we, as science is telling us, then it will behoove us to continue this position uh, ac across society and even expand it because every island is going to need one. Uh, you know, every municipality is going to need one. And of course, there's going to be staff and more green jobs that could arise from these uh, efforts down the road. At the East West Center meeting um, this week, I was, it was interesting to hear uh, the suggestion made that it, mm. the position be, de uh, go to a an, agency. an agency, yeah. a department, and I could see mm -hmm. Katya go, oh, well, we've uh -huh. never had that suggestion before. Uh -huh. um, so um, ever, ever our own. Um, I, I can see why that wouldn't work, but what do you think about the fact that that came up, not just by one person, but there was about three people who, um, what, what does that say? I, I think it says that there's a skepticism about one individual being able to integrate and coordinate and fully express the needs of our multicultural, multi-sectoral population and what he was suggesting. And that decision-making is so concentrated in that office that it would lead to some sort of, you know, problems that we have in politics today. And so by having it, the suggestion was to have an agency be co the coordinate the CRO position, then you have a, at least a distributed decision-making model in that office. So Katya was, um, attempting to allay these fears and said, well, you know, there will also be interns, right? Yeah. So there was some kind of program? Yeah, so uh, the concern was that uh, we need to train the next generation. Uh, and a few years ago, the Department of Energy uh, had a cohort of people, myself included, to come and learn geothermal energy from the previous generation. And then, because they knew that intergenerational communication needed to happen, and so also in resilience, there was a suggestion that we have intergenerational communication and we start training the, the next generation leaders right now with this opportunity. And I think our governor is an engineer and I'm an engineer too. And engineers are the builders of society and we're not often recognized as builders uh, in politics. And so I, I think with uh, an engineer at the helm of this state, uh, we're gonna see a lot more progress in this area uh, than we would maybe with just a politician who might have to come up to speed on all of the science and not understand the actual building aspects of infrastructure uh, res resilience. So there's a there's a very practical level yes. to this too. Yeah. A, a very 
as in, you know, actual things get done? Level? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, after the resilience strategy is developed after the first year, now you have to implement it in the second year. Now, of course, it's not going to get implemented in just one year. But we have a broad range, you know, everything from forests to oceans, the Ahupua'a concept that we all are familiar with, a lot of considerations to be taken into account there. I mean, do we harden our shorelines and then end up destroying our reefs just because we want to stay safe? Or do we retreat from the shoreline? Do we avoid? You know, do we, how do we respond to this threat of sea level rise? And uh, I, I think Chip Fletcher over at um, UH is doing a really good job of modeling some of these things with respect to uh, sea level rise. And Hawaii is actually on the leading edge, absolutely on the leading edge of, of this effort across the world. Uh, the leading edge of, 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 of responding to climate change. Now, are we going fast enough? Uh, you know, climate change is an exponential force. Are we, uh, is our leadership going to be able to respond fast enough? Is our economy going to be able to respond? Is our workforce going to be able to respond? Can we include homeless people in this uh, adaptation plan uh, yeah, for resilience? That homelessness was um, part of that, as we saw early on, yeah. one, of, one of specifically Honolulu's challenges. Yeah. And um, I thought uh, the, uh, one of the other responses was interesting, that there was um, a gentleman who spoke to the, well, well, you oh. know, it shouldn't be somebody from Hawaii because uh -huh. um, we're too f we have too many fractions, and, mm -hmm. and it should be somebody from the outside. Mm -hmm. And do you want to talk about her response? Yeah, her, her response was that, um, you know, she, was, she basically said, you guys are going to decide who that person is. But... Uh, she also said that, uh, or actually, are you talking about the audience response or her response? No, her response. Uh, I don't actually recall her response oh, okay. to that. What she was, was that? saying that, um, that in, in, um, in, in the practice so far, and oh, they're already uh -huh. through two co oh, cohorts, that's that right. it, it, there's, if you bring in someone from the outside, yeah. it there's really a takes learning too, Yeah, there's a yeah. steep learning curve. Yeah. It takes too long for them yeah. to develop the relationships, to understand yeah. the complexities, yeah. especially in a place like Hawaii yeah. with our multi-ethnic uh, multi and cultural and complexities. Cultural. And she, she was talking about some of the other cities, and she said Seattle had... 123 oh, languages. 123 languages wow. that you have to deal with in your adaptation plan. How do it's you like, communicate with those people? Because part of this <coughs> plan strategy is a huge stakeholder engagement process, much like the Hawaii 2050 uh, process we have, which really wasn't broad enough. Uh, you know, how, affordable housing. How do, we, how do we incentivize people to not rent to the highest bidder and rent to people who actually live here? That's just a basic question that we're right now struggling with, but that's gonna become more and more uh, important as we respond to these uh, economic forces uh, of climate change. Yeah, We're gonna actually do this by choice or nature's gonna do it for us. And we should much better for us to do it by choice and have a plan and proceed down a path of inclusion for all our people. Do you have any sense of um, uh, how this is going to play out in terms of, um, let's see, the politics of the position uh, being in Honolulu and then? You know, I, I, I'm not a, really a politician, although I am an, I'm an observer. Yeah. Um, I don't have any idea of how, I mean, are they going to hire on merit, on experience, on you know, youth on political connections, on cultural connections. You know, I mean, uh, ideally you would hire on, on somebody who's most qualified for the whole shebang. Okay. But was there any was there any discussion of um, how the approach is going to be handled? So uh, at the mayor's office, uh, he was saying, you know, submit your applications now. Oh, oh well. But All right. He didn't say how. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I don't know how the process is going to go. I suspect it'll be like any other uh, employment requisition. They'll announce it, and then they'll put a website up, and they'll ask you to submit, and uh, we'll go from there. I mean, when it comes to city funding, there's really going to be no city funding until July of next year because that's when the fiscal year funding begins. 
So, so basically they have until <coughs> July to... No, the to Rockefeller select. Foundation money, of course, is supposedly coming in immediately. Oh. So okay. they can get started on, well, immediately, whether it's January 1st or immediately, I don't know. I can't speculate on that. That's okay. not my... So, so the clock is ticking anyway, very soon. Yeah, very yeah. soon. It okay. seems like the Rockefeller found that we've been given the award, the grants, they got the money, obviously, so sooner we can get... And we're ahead of the curve, actually. She said that multiple times. She said Honolulu is ahead of the curve because we, we even had this position, the Charter Commission position, already approved by the voters this past... Uh, so that's way, we're way ahead of other cities uh, in terms of uh, creating the pathway for this success in this position. So those two things were linked? Uh, yes, it seems like that, yes. Wow. I can't speculate because I wasn't involved in the process. Maxine Burkett was very involved in the process, uh, but I don't know. Uh, well, we have a minute left, Rob. Okay. And um, so in that last minute, would you um, just like to share um, maybe what you, you really hope to see what and what we can do to, to make this, to maximize the impact of this opportunity? You mean Honolulu yeah. or we, you You're, and me? You, us. Well, well I, I would, as, as someone who has been a sustainable leadership coach and an advisor to UH and uh, system office and uh, Maui campus on organizational s sustainability, I would hope that this leads to more jobs for young people, for myself, for other people in the community, green jobs. So far, we haven't really seen that. The solar industry jobs are in decline because of recent discussion, uh, decisions at the utility uh, mm -hmm. side and the g government side. So uh, there's really no strong, there's some entrepreneur startup uh, stuff that's very promising, innovation. I think there was 10 million for uh, the Green Growth Initiative and, and EGACE is going to ask for it. So, but whether that will lead to jobs, I don't know. I, so my hope is that this, will, this job will lead to a cascading effect of infrastructure jobs, of green growth jobs, of green building jobs, of analysis, evaluation, measuring, uh, uh, good jobs that will keep our people in the islands rather than offloading them. Oh, I love that vision. That so speaks to Hawaii. Being my main I want to stay here, so <laughs> I, you know, I, I have a self interest in that. Thank you outcome. so much, Rob. You're welcome. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.